Hi, uh, my name is Emily Smith Gilbert and I'm hosting Shop Talk today. Uh, today we are going to have readings from Susan Scarf Merrill, Christian McQueen, and Matt Clam. Um, I'm so pleased to be doing this. It's been forever since I've actually spoken to my <laughs> coworkers, so it's a real pleasure for me. Um, so first to introduce Susie, um, she's the author most recently of Shirley, a novel, which has been made into a soon to be released major motion picture starring Elizabeth Moss. And with Meg Walitzer, Susie also co-directs um, the post MFA novel intensive bookends of which I'm also an alumni, so, or an alum. Um, so email us if you have questions about that. So now Susie will give her reading. Thanks, Sam. It's very nice to be here. Uh, there's a, um, there's a, a nubbin of true story in, the, in this uh, thing that I'm about to read, which is the full second chapter of my novel in progress, but only two pages long, so that's okay. Um, it's something I might never have identified as part of this fiction had not Bob Reeves asked a group of people one uh, evening about their first jobs and um, I told a story and later Amy Hempel noted that there was something in this memory that was worth writing about and somehow that has transmuted into this two pages that I'm about to read. Chapter two, it's pages 13 and 14 of this novel. One Saturday when we were in junior high, Danny and his father were supposed to drive to North Carolina to pick up a new dog. His mother wasn't feeling well and Danny asked if I would go and sit there, just hang out in the living room on the couch. The girls will be asleep and all you have to do is go in and give Daphne a bottle if she wakes up. You can watch TV all night if you want. His father called and asked my mother and so that's what I did. I remember watching TV. I remember in the middle of the night I heard Mrs. Oaken call and I can picture the apricot color of the light on the stairs as I went up to see her. And what I remember next is Danny bouncing through the door at sunrise, their new Labrador Raven tangling in his legs. The way Danny coiled around the dog and she around him and Mr. Oaken's face was so white, swollen with exhaustion. The girls woke up and the three kids sprawled together on the living room floor, Raven licking their faces and pulling my blanket off the couch with her teeth and everyone laughing. I was jealous. I wished I had sisters the way Danny did, not my older sister Quinn, but little puppyish ones you could play with, who were devoted to you and couldn't wait for you to return and wanted nothing more than to rest a cheek on the crook of your ankle. Mr. Oaken drove me home. We were quiet in the car. He put on his hazard lights and walked me up the single step. My mother came down the short hallway, wiping her hands on a dish towel, and Mr. Oaken told her how good I'd been the night before that when Mrs. Oaken had her miscarriage, I would cleaned her up and changed the sheets, even the bathroom, all of it set to rights. That's a good, responsible girl you have. My mother slung an arm around my shoulders and drew me in. When Danny's father left, I said, I don't know what he's talking about. My mother sat with me on the couch, our mended socks lined up on the brown wall-to-wall -wall carpet that made the place seem even smaller than it was, our hands clasped in my mother's lap. You don't remember? I shook my head. I don't remember anything like that. I'm so tired, Mama. I just want to go to sleep. You're a good girl, my mother said. She pulled me into her arms, and I think I nearly fell asleep there. Later, when my father came home, she told him I was resting under a blanket as if I were sick, and he sat against the pink kirtle of the wool, his thigh against my arm. We were quiet the way it most often was with my father. Later, I got to eat my dinner there on the couch with a TV tray. We watched Jeopardy. Looking back, Raven was my favorite of all the pets Danny had when we were kids. She knew me. She believed from the get-go that I was part of the Oaken family. In the mythology of our love story, Raven was the first to assume that Danny and I belonged together. Danny never did have another sister, just Jessica and Daphne. Now that they were my sisters-in-law, I felt the two was precisely the right number to have. Just like the five of us, me, Cress, Danny, Petey, and Nils had been precisely the right number of friends all through my growing up. 
I haven't thought about this in years. In fact, I've never told Danny this story. I wonder if he knows. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Um, up next, we have Matt Clam, um, the author of the novel Who is Rich, which came out in 2017 and is a New York Times notable book, and also Sam the Cat, a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book of the Year. Um, his magazine features have appeared in the New Yorker, Harper's GQ, the New York Times Magazine, and Esquire. Um, and he also teaches at the Southampton Writers Conference, as well as he teaches classes um, during the semester for Stony Brook MFA. So, Matt, looking forward to your reading. Thanks. Uh, just, uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to read the beginning of a short story that uh, uh, appeared in The New Yorker a couple of weeks ago called The Liver. In the morning, the blinds let in light. I lay on a recliner against the wall with my coat wrapped around my head and heard the nurse pump the blood pressure thing. I'd set up a barrier between us, a towel hanging over the back of a chair for privacy. I'd been reclining here listening to ice blow against the window since about four. Kathy sat up in bed and looked pale, with blue lips and a puffy face. She was still on morphine and seemed serene and angelic. Another nurse walked in pushing a cart and wanted to know if she'd felt milk coming out. Kathy stiffly undid her robe, and both hands trembled, and I saw the funny webbed bandage across her belly. It was sort of threatening and serious and a little sickening, but I was so happy I didn't care and got up then. My pants were open. I shut them. The second nurse wheeled the cart to the edge of the bed. She wore red lipstick, hoop earrings, and a stocking over a tight bun that stood straight up on her head like a bowling pin. She stepped back to let the older nurse explain the breast pumping machine. The older woman was tall and stooped, and wore a short sleeve blouse with kittens on it. Kathy's breasts looked full. She put the cups up to her boobs and the machine started sucking. There was nothing. Then the first drop of milk, bright yellow, dribbled down the tube into the bottle. Oh my God, Kathy said, I'm a fountain. Then another drop. The dairy had come in. What we needed now was a baby. The baby had come two months before her due date after a late night run to the emergency room where, for some reason, Kathy was in labor. We planned on spring, the beautiful explosion of April, the full, ready, ripened flowering, but it was February and she'd been having contractions undiagnosed for two days. And then it was two o'clock in the morning and snowing like crazy and she's lying there in our bed at home, moaning. I suggested the possible psychosomatic reasons for her pain, urging her to reflect on any anxiety that could be causing it. But when she called the ER, the doctor was alarmed. We put on our boots and got in the car and plowed across Western Ave in silence, the only ones on the road, shocked at the sight of it, road signs half buried and fences swamped in drifts, each spindly vein of every branch articulated in gloppy white, and more coming down. The airport was closed, power lines bowed in swooping arcs almost to the ground, and we held ourselves steady, a little dumbstruck, passing stuck city buses and evergreen boughs broken in the street, and finally spun up the hill toward a glowing emergency sign under a great overhanging deck, and a tall security guard in a rabbit fur helmet took Kathy inside while I parked. Our nurse seemed alarmed too and called an emergency labor specialist and they tried over the next hours but couldn't get it to stop. And the baby was facing forward, which was wrong and was upright, also wrong, appearing on screen with her hands and feet pushed against the front of her bubble as if she were driving a truck. A new doctor appeared, an older man, an expert in premature birth who looked out the window and clapped his hands and said, there goes my golf game. But he was worried that the cord might suffocate her and that once he got her out, 
our lungs might not work. And after those first breaths, other things, even at this venerable gestational age of 33 weeks, he said the name of something and told you what it meant. It was nothing too dark or devastating to divulge, brain lining and colon perforations and invading bacteria, the insulation around her nerves. And as she grew, it might be months or years before we knew the whole story, a higher incidence of cerebral palsy, mental retardation. It had begun wrong and now it would never end. After some hours of labor, they did a scalp test to see how the baby was doing. During the worst parts, Kathy attacked the wall with her claws. In between contractions, it got quieter because there was nothing left to say. I jogged to the nurse's station to complain for her, stopping on the elevated pedestrian bridge where the ancient red-sweatered volunteer ladies looked over the hospital grounds, cataloging the snowfall with immense concentration. They were trapped, too. We agonized over how much weight the roof could take. Then the doctor did another test and suddenly new faces rushed into the room and put Kathy on a gurney while she signed the papers. I saw it all, the seven layers of skin, the yellowish fat, the muscle wall, the wall of the uterus, the blood. I hadn't known what to expect. So when the baby arrived, blue, screaming like a maniac, it was whatever I'd been feeling, plus relief, ratcheted all the way up. Her lungs worked, she appeared to have all her parts, and they took her away. Kathy gave me a crimped smile, just a head behind a sheet, flying high on morphine. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, up next, we have Christian McLean, whose fiction has been published in The Rumpus, The Southampton Review, which I edit, um, and <laughs> The Scores. He also is co-director of the Southampton Writers Conference, and he teaches um, in the creative writing program uh, at Stony Brook University. And he's also my next door neighbor, usually when we actually work in a physical location. So very excited to have you here and to read for us. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun, actually and touching base with everyone. Um, this is a short story that I'm, I'm still working on um, and it doesn't have a title yet, but uh, uh, it goes like this. They had ordered the mausoleum from China three months in advance. It was still in a container over the Pacific when Mark died. His father had told them this was going to happen. Can't trust China. He'd been in the Korean War. He had seen something they hadn't. They who bought everything off the internet, didn't understand why he wouldn't want to buy a mausoleum from it too. Dad, everything's made in China, Mark said. They even have marble like Carrera. When Karen called the website, when they realized how quickly Mark's illness had progressed, customer service said the shipment would arrive in a day or two, a week at most. They emailed a new tracking number, Karen refreshed the shipping website like she was giving CPR. It was still a week out from port. Then Mark was dead and in the wall of a cemetery, one of those tombs behind a plaque. The inscription on the outside was blank. The cemetery director said it was standard practice. Often mausoleums take time. He said that the straight face well, wasn't built in a day. Karen had thought the idea of a mausoleum was a bit much. She and Mark had gone tombstone shopping in March. She had finished her shift at the bakery and wasn't in the mood. Not that there is a mood for it. She was the one who called them tombstones. They're monuments, the salesman said. Mark spit back, that's why the prices are monumental. They left pissed. Karen, had been, because she had been made to feel stupid, and Mark, for feeling like he hadn't done enough to defend her, that he never would. When Mark climbed into bed, exhausted by the day and the illness devouring his body, he said, you could check Amazon. Mostly what they found on Amazon were monuments for pets, small ones, 12 by 10 inches, laser etched with paws. The dates were short, the quotes tragic. Cleo, 2017 to 2019. Time spent with cats is never wasted, Sigmund Freud. As they slipped off Amazon, Karen clicked from one site to the next. 
there were menu options. And as Karen read down the alphabetical listing, angel, classic, childs, she paused, absorbing the understanding of something they would never have. Mark pointed at the link for mausoleums. Amuse me, he said. The stone buildings were named after Renaissance painters. One even had a dome and was called the Brunelleschi. Maybe there are lesser known artists, Mark smiled. Where is the Thomas Kincaid Museum, Karen said. A few more clicks and they were on the clearance page and found the Dossi priced to sell at $1,500 with free shipping. I want that, he said. What do you tell someone who is picking out their own place of eternal rest? Do you tell them no, get something more economical? You're not worth something so grand? Maybe we could save up for it if you just give us a little more time? It's kind of big, Karen said. Imagine me in my very own mausoleum, he said. And there's plenty of space for you too, you know, when he ran his thumb across his neck. Mark made fun of dying and Karen understood it was part of some process he used to cope, but understanding didn't mean she wasn't broken by it. Unless you meet someone else, Mark said, it's okay if you do. This thing looks like there's enough room for all three of us. We could be an afterlife trouble. Karen had thought about meeting someone else. It was something that embarrassed her. She wasn't planning on anything. She wasn't setting up a profile on Bumble, but sometimes in the shower with the hot water on high, her skin burning, She'd wonder what it would be like to meet someone new. She'd wonder about the length of time it made sense to wear a wedding ring after becoming a widow. There had to be rules about it. A year, two years, she wasn't going to wear black. She and Mark had already talked about it. I didn't wear white at her wedding. I'm not wearing black at your funeral, she said. He told her to wear the boldest color she could find. Not a hot pink miniskirt, he said, but a bright yellow dress. It'll be summer, own it. Despite his disagreement with buying anything from China, Mark's father insisted on paying for the mausoleum. He said, it is enough that a father has to bury his boy. The least I can do is pay for it. And while Mark joked about dying with Karen, about leaving his wife to tear up the town in near nothing fishnets, he and his father generally pretended it wasn't happening. They talked about the lawn care, aerating the soil, seeding the grass, Mark told him to stop using the turf builder because of the water table. When the mausoleum did arrive on the 12th of May, it was delivered to Mark's father's house. He had not clicked delivery addresses different than billing address when filling out the online form. 30 tons of Chinese stone, the size of a shipping container was lowered onto his freshly aerated and seated front lawn while he was drinking coffee at the VFW. The delivery men thought they were doing a favor and removed the sides and top of the crate. They pulled away the styrofoam. It cracked and popped. Tiny white balls blew in the wind like a micro blizzard and clung on the cold stone. If the delivery men had paid attention, they would have noticed Mark's father was required to sign for the delivery, but they were too busy being nice, too busy clearing the detritus. Then they packed up and were gone. Karen had still been checking the shipping website, which claimed the mausoleum was still on a boat at the port of Los Angeles. Thanks. Thanks so much, Christian. Um, so I, if anyone has any questions, definitely type them in the chat. Um, but I have a question that is for all of you. Um, and since you're sort of like a captive audience, uh, I expect an answer. So I'm going to sort of muddle through this because it's, it's kind of a long one. So basically, most of our characters, the reason why we start writing about them is because they have experienced some event at the beginning that was unexpected in some way. Like a lot of fiction is just writing about people dealing with having to handle something unexpected. And that is the situation in which the entire world finds itself in. Um, and so my question sort of has to do with 
is this changing how you're thinking about writing characters? Because it's not just an unexpected event that will alter their life, but it's something that is gonna profoundly shift the world that we live in. So is that changing how you're thinking about writing your characters and how they're dealing with what is unexpected in their lives? Or is it not? But if so, how? And um, I guess the other part of it is a lot of our characters also are thinking about things that have happened in the past and trying to kind of incorporate that into their present and understand what happened in their past. But now it's like, does it strike you as it's almost meaningless? Because whatever world that they're living in now going forward is gonna be so different from whatever they were trying to figure out in their past. Like it almost doesn't apply. Does that make sense? Anyways, discuss, please. <laughs> You, Susie, you're on mute, and Christian too, it looks like. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, before you guys get started, I don't know if one person can answer these enormous questions. I'm gonna just say two things. One is that this morning for the first time I heard jokes about how uh, high school juniors are going to be writing their how the coronavirus <laughs> uh, uh, e epidemic, um, uh, how this, the pandemic changed uh, their lives essays for their incoming college essays and how admissions reps are already going to be hating to read those essays because they'll see so many of them. But I couldn't help but think that though there is uh, a lot of profundity in this experience and that people will be finding, uh, you know, like, um, like uh, important material to write about. And also that a friend pointed out to me that Hemingway mentioned exactly once, and I don't know, remember where it was, the Spanish flu, meaning the Nobel Prize winning American author that came out of that period never mentioned it, basically. So, uh, maybe it didn't mean That's that much. <laughs> so, I'm going to flip around the and essentially say the same thing as Matt because we have the same birthday. I feel I can say the same thing as Matt. But um, there's a wonderful uh, book about auditioning for actors called Audition by a guy named Michael Shirtleff. And he talks about, um, it's a very simple, wonderful book that I think I've talked about with you and before um, about how actors build character. And I think that one of the things that's really true for, um, for all of us is that we're always building our fictional experience from real experience and vice versa, that that interplay of what is, um, what is an, a, an experiential truth and an emotional truth is always interplaying. So to answer the first part of your question, I don't think it really changes anything. We are, um, we're just incorporating a really horrible new piece of data into our imaginative processes and how that ends up um, emerging in fictionalized form is something yet to be seen. Um, so that's the answer to the, the first part. And then I'll let Christian answer and then I'll we can come back to the second question. Well, it's, I mean, my thought is that there's, there's a couple things. One is you can write your characters and their stories happen you know, in 2019, right, or 2017, and, and you can sort of avoid that in a way. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I'm working on something else, and and it takes place in two, it takes place in 2009, but the character thinks about 9/11, and so like when you're thinking about these these massive moments in our lives, like they they can filter through, but they don't. They can only they can come in just like in our lives. They come in for a moment, and then they sort of maybe dissipate and while this is a huge shift for every single being in, in the world in a way, our you know, our characters don't have to, you know, once this is over, our characters will have to get on with their lives in, in everyday in ways again. And I think that while it may come up and it will definitely change how they view things, uh, it doesn't have to sort of totally change their, their story, if that makes sense. Yeah. Susie, did you have more to add? Oh, just to the second part, um, the 
I, I mean, I think you're, the, I think the second part of your question was essentially like, is it worth doing this if, you know, the world has gone to- Oh, I mean, yes, but I feel like that applies to so much. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think also since we're essentially living as we like in the kind of environment we sometimes put our characters in where they just don't know what will happen next, like how does that actually influence like the writing currently if you are writing, I think. And can you rec like, what can you do? How do you do it? So I just, so I wanna say something about, uh, you know, the Bookends Fellowship that has been having these Wednesday afternoon meetings where we just kind of talk for an hour about what everybody is thinking about. And at, at one point somebody said, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble. Like when my characters go to touch each other, I, even though my book is set in a different time period, I have like, oh, you, you can't do that. And I, I think in, in essence, when when this period is overwhelming, and this is an overwhelming thing that's happening, but when we're um, when we're not in our actual in the actual imaginative world that we've created, I think we feel more overwhelmed by uh, by the circumstances of social distancing and um, and the horrible news in all ways and the insane. Um, things that are happening in the government and everything else. But when you allow yourself into the world of your own story, there's a kind of, even if your story is about upset people and bad things happening, there's a kind of beautiful uh, peace there. Like you, you're in your lane and you can, you can move in that world more easily. I don't know if that's a, an answer that you all would agree with. I guess I would, it does feel like you're writing in a time before, unless you're specifically writing about now, which I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Somebody was, um, uh, a friend of mine was looking at hit films during um, like key, like uh, very trying moments uh, during World War II, uh, the Korean War in Vietnam and found um, that there were uh, a lot of um, like wartime romances in those um, among those films, and um, he was sort of surprised. And um, I couldn't help but think uh, that people um, want to read about um, things that are incredibly important to them that are entirely uh, from like a, a, a very subjective, you know, uh, place like a love story, even though the rest of the world is kind of coming apart around them. And I think it's important for writers to remember, you know, writing has always been, um, uh, and for me, fiction writing has always been something that I've felt a little bit, uh, has this a little bit of like an adolescent quality in that I want to kind of go up to my room, slam the door, you know, turn the music on loud the way, you know, we caricature teenagers doing, but it, re it requires that kind of self-absorption and which is a great filter because um, if, then if you think, well, how am I supposed to address this global event? Um, you know, the answer is probably a lowercase answer. It's not, um, you know, uh, as daunting when you think of it as something that's, you're, you're, you're seeing through the, this very narrow funnel of your own perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think also, yeah, I think um, this just popped into my head, which is like not necessarily a response to that comment, but just I wonder if there will be much less post-apocalyptic fiction because we are all living it. <laughs> and I can't be the only one to wonder about that. Um, I just wanted to be, a comment um, from Hollis Kerman. She says, they say the intimacy of these stories, especially in the death slash dying slash hospital scenes feels especially poignant right now that there can be so little of it at those moments, which is definitely true. Um, I think one of the hardest things is people alone in these hospitals. Um, 
so I think um, I'm, yeah, I think I'm just gonna close by asking each of you what you're currently reading and, um, and then we'll just say goodbye because I think it's always good to get recommendations. <laughs> Susie, what is that? The Baron in the Trees by Calvino, which I'm teaching tomorrow. But, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also really looking forward to reading this. Hmm. That's great. I don't have the books in front of me, but I'm, I'm reading um, A Gentleman in Moscow, and I'm also reading um, Swiss Family Robinson. And, uh, and both of them sort of inform, you know, they're, they're, they change now that I'm reading them, because I, start, I started Gentleman in Moscow prior to, um, and it takes place in the 1920s to 1940s in, in Moscow, where, where scarcity is, is an actual thing. And, and sort of, it's interesting to read it while scarcity is happening here, something that I never thought would happen. You just reminded me that I promised to send you guys all a chicken from Washington, <laughs> D.C. Uh, so before we go, I make sure I'll get your addresses. Um, uh, I'm reading um, The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, which was like her second book, I think, and it's the one that doesn't have any murder in it because it has this kind of terrific love story that they adapted into a movie that came out a couple of years ago. Carol. I the name of the movie. Carol, yeah. Yeah, Carol. And, uh, and I'm also reading Rousseau's Confessions, and I don't know why it's been around for a while, but I don't know if you guys have noticed, but like I've had an easier time concentrating, reading, like maybe at night, maybe it's, I don't know, I mean, I've also had trouble concentrating for more than 15 seconds at certain phases, but I think it's just the quiet or whatever. Anyway, in Rousseau's Confessions in 1742 or whatever, he's sent um, to uh, be the, the uh, secretary for um, this French ambassador in Venice. And when he gets to Messina on the boat, there's a plague and he's um, quarantined. And it's this great scene, it's 21 days, and he uh, chooses to be put into this building, this empty hospital building alone. And uh, it's a, there's a really nice scene where he just is talking about how uh, much he's enjoying the quiet of the quarantine. So <laughs> anyway. Well, great, thank you for that. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in to Shop Talk with Matt Clam, Susie Merrill, and Christian McLean. And there is another event coming up uh, this Wednesday, April 8th at 1 p.m. Um, there will be readings by Simeon Marsalis and Donnie Welton, and it will be hosted by Paul Harding. So hope to see you then. All right, stay safe, be well. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.